When we talk about restoration artifacts, the first thing that comes to my mind are the restoration scriptures. This is the world-changing, life-changing artifact for all time. And it came as a result of people sacrificing, in some cases, everything that they had, including their own lives, that the repository of the most important artifacts could be available to the world. And by the most important artifacts, I mean the doctrines that had been restored after centuries and centuries of darkness. I mean the covenants that are as old, really, as the human family that were revealed and instituted back in the days of our first parents. The material culture that we can grasp is fun because it conjures up in our minds uh, people who use them. But it's really the people passing on the life-changing artifacts, the scriptures, the covenants, the stories, the history that I think is the greatest blessing in people's lives. What I am holding in my hand right now, I recognize immediately as an 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. This is the first edition bound nicely with a high quality leather binding. Not every copy was bound the same way, but this one was obviously a special book. Can you tell me whose book this was? So we don't know exactly whose book it was, but on the outer covering we have the blue speckled ink. We have S. Tuck stamped multiple times. And in the back, we have the testimony of the eight witnesses and the testimony of the three witnesses. And next to that page, we have S. Tuck stamped near the end, apparently claiming her book. And it was from Martin Harris to Sheila Tuck. I'm not sure exactly who it is, mm -hmm. but it's in the iron gall ink of the period. And we only have a limited amount of Martin's handwriting in his own hand because he didn't really keep very many documents or a journal. But it appears that what we have is a book that Martin Harris, who helped finance the printing of the Book of Mormon, he was there making those choices to have this thing exist. It looks like he got one of the copies right off of the press, subscribed it to one of his friends, and delivered it to her and that she took care of it. She stamped her name all over it. I remember something that uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said about types and shadows of the Messiah. He was talking about uh, people in Old Testament times who were types and foreshadowings of the coming of the Messiah. And then he said, in point of fact, it isn't just individuals who are types and foreshadows of the coming of the Messiah, he says, the whole house of Israel, ancient and modern, is a type and a foreshadowing of the Messiah. And I like to think of restoration artifacts in that way. The artifacts that make the greatest difference are the people who use the scriptures. And so, yes, it's true, we can grasp an item of material culture but we can also grasp the hand of our contemporaries who themselves are artifacts of the Restoration, if you follow Elder McConkie's logic. We are the living artifacts of the Restoration of the Gospel in these last days. These three books comprise Brigham Young's last set of scriptures. This is a Bible. This is his 1876 Book of Mormon and his 1876 Doctrine and Covenants. Each of these has his well-known signature. And the Doctrine and Covenants, 1876 was the first time 26 new sections were added. And this is an important addition and this is one of the only known sets of scriptures that is actually annotated by President Brigham Young, where he has marked numerous scriptures and made annotations in the margins. There's even a few little souvenirs 
that were kept in the book. Art and artists are spoken of in Scripture. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 31, is written, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezaliel the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, which means artistic designs. Continuing in Exodus chapter 31, the Lord says, And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. The tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle. Significant works of art were used in the tabernacle, then later in the temple in Jerusalem. In our dispensation, artifacts of the restoration include artistic expressions of the restoration. These can be any art that contribute to our faith, understanding, and devotion to God, and that inform and encourage us to walk the covenant path. Art in various media can be very meaningful expressions of faith, doctrine, history, and admonition. Just as the parables given by the Savior express stories that instruct us, artistic works of many kinds are restoration artifacts. Artists in this dispensation have expressed visually what the scriptures explain verbally. These depictions have brought the scriptures to life in many ways. In Denmark in 1850, a young man named C.C.A. Christensen was baptized by missionaries. He had studied art at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts and was a painter. He emigrated to Utah in a handcart company in 1857. He painted early pioneer houses in Springville until he was commissioned to paint scenes from the Bible and the Book of Mormon. He also painted some of the murals on the walls of the St. George Temple and the Manti Temple. In 1878, he created a large Mormon panorama of 23 paintings. Christensen transported these paintings in a large roll through Utah Territory and Idaho and Wyoming, giving presentations about church history. Eventually, a century later, his paintings were displayed at an art gallery in New York City. In 1890, President Wilford Woodruff sent six Latter-day Saint artists on a mission to Paris, France, to improve their artistic talents so they could return and paint the murals on the walls of the Salt Lake Temple. John Hafen was among those Latter-day Saint artists who painted the murals on the walls in the Salt Lake Temple, dedicated in 1893. In 1909, John Hafen published a booklet with art depicting the concepts expressed by Eliza R. Snow in her poem, Oh My Father, about the plan of salvation. Her poem was also set to music and is a beloved hymn in the hymn book. In the mid-20th century, Minerva Teichert was another Latter-day Saint artist. She studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, then went on to New York City for further art courses. Returning to Utah, she painted murals in the Manti and Salt Lake temples. While raising her family in rural Wyoming, she depicted many stories described in the scriptures. She was a prolific artist. Minerva Teichert painted 42 Book of Mormon murals. For her children's college education at Brigham Young University, she painted beautiful scriptural scenes in trade for their tuition. This is how Brigham Young University came to own many of her paintings. Her style was unique and fresh with a strong women's perspective. Through her artwork, she expressed her faith in Christ and her testimony of the gospel. Many other Latter-day Saint artists have expressed visually the events and images of the Restoration. Their art is recognized as significant Restoration artifacts. In 1951, the primary general president, Adele Cannon Howells, wanted paintings depicting scenes from the Book of Mormon to be published in the Children's Friend magazine. 
On her own, with her own money, she commissioned Latter-day Saint artist Arnold Freeberg to paint a series of twelve Book of Mormon scenes. Arnold was a member of the church, and with this commission he studied Book of Mormon people, teachings, and key events to visualize how they may have appeared. He conceptualized many details and began sketching and painting. After completing the first paintings, a visitor sent photos of them to the Hollywood film director Cecil B. DeMille, who was preparing to film the movie The Ten Commandments. DeMille met with Arnold Freeberg, and based on his Book of Mormon paintings, he hired him to create artwork to set the tone for the visualization of the Ten Commandments. Arnold Freeberg painted scenes that were referenced by the production designer and art director to bring to life the characters, costumes, and events in the Ten Commandments. The artists who animated the parting of the Red Sea built upon the vision Arnold Freeberg set forth. Freeberg introduced President David O. McKay to Cecil B. DeMille, and the two of them became close friends. Arnold Freeberg was nominated for an Academy Award for his work on the Ten Commandments. After the film was released, Freeberg completed the twelve Book of Mormon paintings. Years later, his most famous painting is The Prayer at Valley Forge, depicting George Washington kneeling in prayer during the War of Independence. Arnold Freeberg's Book of Mormon paintings were published in copies of the Book of Mormon for many years. They bring to life the people and events in the Book of Mormon. These detailed oil paintings are themselves restoration artifacts. The original paintings are framed and on display in Salt Lake City in the Church Conference Center in the Book of Mormon Gallery. Whole generations of saints have grown up visualizing the people in the Book of Mormon as Arnold Freeberg conceptualized and portrayed them. These paintings are restoration artifacts. Let us recall the story of a widow in the British Isles many years ago. To visitors she lamented that her three sons were not taking care of her. She was destitute and she may have felt that she failed them. The boys had all gone off to sea in the Navy and the Merchant Marines. She'd become alone and penniless. Then a visitor saw a large painting hanging over her mantle. It was a majestic sailing ship at sea. The painting had been there as the boys grew up in their home. Of course they went off to sea, because they were raised with this image prominently in their home. The things we hang on the walls of our homes have impact on our children and grandchildren. Paintings or other images on our walls show our values. Children see them and learn from them that those things should be valued. What else would a child conclude? A child thinks, my parents or my grandparents think these things are important. So what you display on your walls will end up in their hearts. They will pursue those things. Artist Del Parson is perhaps best known for his art depicting the Savior. I'm always constantly uh, thinking of what to paint. This idea of, of this particular painting, where it came from, the, the art show that I'm uh, submitting the painting for, they had a theme. And this particular one is that all are alike unto God. So it was a little bit more on the idea that God loves everybody, not just a certain kind of person. But the idea is the Savior is showing this young man the way. So the name of the painting is The Way. I'm just grateful that I paint the Savior because when I'm painting the Savior, it reminds me of the things that I should be doing. I would just say that's a wonderful thing for people to do art it's a wonderful thing for them to do subject matter that is, you know, important to them. And if, some, if, if, if a person wanted to paint the Savior, that is fantastic. And, it's, and I don't know if anybody's going to like this painting. I just do the best I can. I would hope that it, it's acceptable and, and like it. But if not, it was, it was a great experience for me and it really helps me 
do the right thing and stay on in the straight and narrow. I'm, I'm grateful that I've painted paintings of the Savior. I'm grateful for that, for, for what it's, how it's influenced my life. I, right now, I would rather paint the Savior than anything else. And it's just almost like, boy, after you paint the Savior, what, what even comes close? Nothing else comes close. Everything else is just kind of minor compared to painting uh, such an important person. And uh, I was commissioned by the church to do three paintings, and the Red Robe Christ was one of them. That was in 1983. That Red Robe Christ, when I was doing that painting, of course, I prayed as hard as I could. I, every day, I just, numerous times, please help me with this painting. Please help me depict what that would have me do. It was a painting for the church, and I was told what they wanted more than anything else was a Mormon image of the Savior. So they wanted an image where this is the God of the universe, a masculine image of the Savior. So that was kind of some of the instructions I was given. That was part of it, but I, for me personally, the number one thing I was thinking, Christ is real, and I'm gonna to try to paint that feeling, that testimony that I have that Christ is real. We went through all kinds of expressions, and what's interesting about the painting of the Red Robe Christ, I've really found that sometimes the expression changes for me even as an artist. I look at it, and I'd probably if I've been living a, a real good life and you know, keeping the commandments, there's kind of a real gentle smile but, it's, but sometimes if, this is just me, if I look at it and I'm not that way, I actually see a frown on that painting. And so that, the, the expression on that painting is right in the middle somewhere. I mean, it can, it can, it can go different ways. Uh, and I don't, know for, I, don't think, I don't know if I did that on purpose. I, I think sometimes things happen. But I would hope that when a person would look at my paintings, they would say, God is real and he loves me. If they got that from my painting, I would be totally satisfied. I couldn't be any happier than those two things. The art of the Book of Mormon has been one legacy of what we do here at Book of Mormon Central, uh, because the Book of Mormon has been depicted in a lot of different ways over the course of history. Early 1900s, you've got artists just beginning to start to want to do, uh, to depict these stories. CCA Christensen, and then later in the 1940s, Minerva Tykert, Arnold Freeberg. Book of Mormon art in a lot of ways has exploded and experienced a little bit of a, a renaissance as the church has sponsored art competitions and Book of Mormon Central has tried to enter into that foray doing an annual art contest. And so it's been really fascinating to see Amateur and some professional artists from all over the world submit art depicting the Book of Mormon and specifically scenes we've never seen depicted before. Artist Dan Thornton is well known in the church for his art of the Nauvoo Temple. When a person exercises their creative talent, no matter what it is they're creating, whether it's a painting like Arnold Freeberg did here to illustrate this event, or it's actually Nephi following the inspiration he received to build a ship. That creativity being exercised requires faith. It requires vision. It requires hope. It requires a desire for better. Creating is making things better. If anyone really brings the Book of Mormon to life, uh, it is Arnold Freeberg. I always have admired the paintings of Arnold Freeberg's where it was in the Book of Mormon, and it encouraged me to go and do artwork. They were just so wonderful. So the brother Jared obviously had to have great faith and a great testimony to have the Lord first off show his hand and his finger to him and then show himself to the brother Jared. Arnold Freeberg, he's one of the best draftsmen that I'm just acquainted with. He could draw so well. He could depict, uh, like if you look at this one right here, you just say, boy, the feeling of that fur on his clothes, just like the tension of detail. As an artist, I just would look and say, well, how did he do it? That's, that's something I'm always doing. Lehi, the morning he came, woke up and looked outside his tent door and saw the Leahona, how he's taken the family of Lehi and the family of Ishmael and they're all gathered around as Father Lehi is examining this ball. You can see the different characters, who's who. 
it's clear that Nephi is the one next to his father by the way he shows affection towards his father and attentive interest in the Liahona. I love how Nephi takes up half of this image and his brothers take up the other half, three of them, because it really shows the power that Nephi has and how prominent he, of, a, of a person he was. The gesture and the feeling about something, like the feeling of that wind coming in, like, and here's the sail there, there's the birds flying. It, just that feeling of that boat moving through the water, the, the feeling that they're finally arriving at the, the promised land, this beautiful gesture right there. They, also, he's just wonderful colors. I, I, I just looking at this right here, I just go, this is just so wonderful, the different colors in that water as it moves back. Up close is kind of a green into wave, goes into some purple colors, then some light blue, and then in some violets back here. But just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful artist. Arnold Freeberg portrays the faith and humility of Father Lehi, looking heavenward, giving thanks to his heavenly father for safely bringing his family across the vast oceans. I always love this painting. You know, just all these cool details. You know, like here's a, you know, here's this, like here's a jaguar sitting there and, and Austin looks like he got upset about something. His, the wine's tipping over there. He just told the story so well. You could spend a long, long time looking at a painting like this. All the little details, I don't know for sure how he did it. Uh, his crown, uh, even his soldiers are uh, dressed uh, in uh, glistening armor. He has uh, jaguars or leopards as uh, pets at his throne. And yet the real power is not in the material things, but in the wisdom of the prophet Abinadi when you look at that, every single thing is very, very accurate. That's the, that is the coat of a jaguar. He told the story better than anyone I can almost think of. Just a great, great artist. In this painting, they're making covenants, and those who make covenants are referred to as saints. So our church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or people who make these covenants, which is very, very cool um, to have these promises for, with God and um, being able to have eternal life. When we couple our abilities that the Lord gives us with faith that he will empower us to accomplish that which is far greater than what we can do ourselves, that's when great miracles happen in our lives. That's when we're able to really create and make a beautiful world. And we live in a time when exercising our creative gifts with faith in God is so needed. Alma 46, 12 reads, And it came to pass that he rent his coat, and he took a piece thereof and wrote upon it, In memory of our God, our religion and freedom, and our peace, our wives and our children, and he fastened it upon the end of a pool. We have such a great history of art in our church. When I go over to church, I see a painting of Christ by Haven. There's that history, and of course, I just think of like Minerva Tigert, and she went off to New York to learn how to be an artist, and eventually settled out west on a ranch with her husband. There's been such a history of wonderful artists. It's so hard for me to do art. I know how hard it is. You give everything you've got in that piece of art. I just look at the art being produced right now. It's almost like a renaissance, a beautiful, beautiful spiritual religious art that is just so wonderful. It's definitely meaningful. It's definitely important in our lives. It's going to influence our lives for good. If they're in your home, it's going to bring that spirit into your home. I think some of the best art that's ever been produced could almost be produced right now, too. But there has been great art in the past.